I have uh, great news, I think, for the fathers in the house. And I think it's great news for everyone who has ears to hear. And the great news may be discovered in a conversation between Jesus and the Apostle Peter, one of our favorite apostles. We think he may have been a husband and a father. And us guys like Peter because he speaks and acts before he thinks, right? It kind of, I resonate with that, a person who often puts his foot in his mouth. And I want to point you to a conversation, a short conversation he had in the upper room. It took place less than 24 hours before Jesus was crucified. And it's where we find this great news for fathers. Luke 22, and I'm looking at verses 31 through 34. Luke 22, 31 to 34. Again, we're in the upper room. The apostles have had the Lord's Supper. Judas has already betrayed Jesus. He's left the room. And now Jesus turns his attention to Peter, and he says these words, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brethren. And Peter replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison, even to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, before the morning comes, before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you know me. What a word. And you're probably wondering, where is the great news in that word? But let me explain it by breaking down those few verses into three bite-sized pieces, into three statements. And the first statement is found in verse 31. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Simon, Simon. Notice a few details with me in that statement. Notice that Jesus addresses the apostle as Simon, the name given to him as birth. He does not call him Peter, the name Jesus gave him when he called him to be an apostle. He says, Simon. Kind of reminds me when your mother calls you out and uses your full name, right? Samuel Michael. Well, that's actually my son. I guess he tried to take my place here and preached here not long ago, huh? Yeah, young buck, you know. Samuel Michael. So he says, Simon. And then he repeats the name which is a favorite tactic of Jesus, expressing intimacy. You know, when you're mad at someone, as we'll find out later, you just say, Simon, get your act together. Or George, clean up your room. Or John, do this. You know, when you're yelling at someone, you don't say, John, John. But when you come up to someone and, oh, I'm going the wrong way. This is my border over here. Sorry about that in Hebron. Ooh, man, I got to watch out. I was gravitating towards this wonderful family here. I'll gravitate towards you. You're wonderful too. But when you want to come up to, what's your name? Becky. And you say, and you want something you want to talk about, serious, you say, Becky, Becky, right? Simon, Simon, there's something I need to talk to you about. And then notice finally in this short sentence that Jesus addresses Simon as the unofficial leader of the group. Now you have to know a little Greek to pick that up because here in the text it says, Satan has asked for permission to sift all of you. I'm talking about you, Simon, and 
the apostles, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked permission to sift all of you. Now notice the content of the statement. Jesus tells Peter that Satan has requested permission to sift the apostles as wheat. Satan would like to test the apostles, believing that if put to the test, they will fail Jesus just like Job did. Now, first century farmers, I'm not a farmer, but there, I drove out here, and there's a lot of farmers out here. If you grow wheat, you, you cut down the wheat, and you harvest the wheat back in the first century. You cut down your wheat, you put it in a pile, you put your fork in the, into the wheat, you throw the, the fork, the, the wheat into the ground, and the wind would blow away the lousy stuff, and the good wheat would fall back to the ground. Satan thinks that he can take the apostles, throw them up into the air, and the wind will blow them away. They'll be sifted out, and they'll betray the Lord, and there'll be nothing left to them. And apparently, Jesus granted Satan permission to do this. Yeah, go ahead. Sift my apostles and see what happens. Because Jesus says to Peter, when you turn back, and the implication is here, when you mess up, when you fall short, when you fail, turn back. That means when you repent of your sins, turn back. Peter was offended by this and said, Lord, I'm picking up what you're dropping down here. You're saying that Satan's going to sift me and I'm going to fall. I'm going to mess up. And Peter says, let me tell you right here and right now, I'm ready to go with you to prison and even to death. Now notice this. Jesus hears that and he doesn't come back with, Simon, Simon. <laughs> he comes back and says, I'll tell you, Rock. Let me tell you something, Peter. Let's get this straight. Before the morning comes, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Now, you're still wondering, where's the good news in all that? Well, here's my takeaway. The amazing reality is not that Peter would deny the Lord. Each human being falls. Every one of us falls short of the glory of God. The amazing reality here is that Jesus knew Peter would deny him, and still Jesus stuck with him. He knew Peter would deny him. He knew that Peter would fall short, and he still stuck with him. And that is the good news, because like Peter, each person here turns his back on the Lord. Each father here screws up. And there's no surprise there that we screw up and turn our back on the Lord. The amazing reality is that God the Father knows we're gonna mess up and still calls us to faith in Christ and still calls us to be fathers, still calls us to be mothers, still calls us to be children, still calls them to serve them, even though he knows we're gonna mess up. That's the amazing reality here. God chooses us, God calls us, he adopts us, he commissions us, he empowers us, knowing full well that we'll deny him, that we'll betray him, that we will turn our back on him, that we'll steal glory from him, that we'll lose our passion for him, and yet he still calls us. It must be clear then that our relationship with God has little to do with works. I used to 
coached college baseball, and I noticed a difference between players who felt that their time, their playing time was dependent on their performance that day, and players who knew that no matter how they did, they'd be in the lineup the next day, right? There are those who say, well, man, if I screw up, I'm going to get pulled out. And there are those who know that, man, I may screw up today, but I'll still be in the lineup tomorrow. There's a security in that. And there's a security in our call to Jesus Christ that he puts us out there. He calls us to be fathers. He calls us to service in him, knowing we're going to mess up. It must be clear then that our calling, our relationship with God has little to do with our works. Our relationship with God, our calling to be fathers, has everything to do with his grace. Ephesians 2 makes it clear, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our position, our calling is secure. That is great news for fathers, for those who mess up. Amen? The second statement is this. Jesus said, I've prayed that your faith may not fail you. First, Jesus predicts Peter's betrayal. Then Jesus says, I'm praying that your faith may not fail. What in the world does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that I'm praying that you don't pass the test, that you pass the test. Because if Jesus prays that we pass the test, we're going to pass the test. Amen? <laughs> so it doesn't mean that. It must mean something else. I'm praying that when you fail, when you screw up, when you fall short, that your faith may not fail. When you mess up, I don't want you to throw in the towel and give up and say, I'm never going to do this again. When we fall short, he's saying, I don't want you to throw in the towel, be knocked out by the blows of Satan, Peter. When you fall short, Peter, I'm praying that your faith will not fail so you don't wind up like Judas, whose faith, who failed the test, who betrayed Jesus, and whose faith failed him, for he took his own life. He was so despondent over his failure. I'm praying that your faith, your confidence in me, will not fail. You know, from time to time, every one of us falls short. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, you're, you're reformed, you know that. <laughs> I grew up being told you're a sinner. Okay, you're falling short. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I got that down. Um, we're going to fall short. Sometimes, let's just, apply it to fathers, sometimes we fall short in providing positive examples of loving our wives. We don't model that Christ-like behavior of loving your wife as Christ has loved the church. Sometimes we fall short by losing our emotions you know, and we just act like idiots, basically, right? Got to the point where, as a father, I, I had to, when I watched my kids play baseball or softball, I'd have to sit in the left field so the umpires wouldn't kick me out of the game, you know, because I got this big voice, and then once in a while I'd be yelling at an ump who was a member of my church. That doesn't work well, right? That's just bad. And, you know, so once in a while when I was coaching, I wanted to get kicked out. You know, I went out there with the idea, I just need to get kicked out. But most of the time, it was like, what am I doing here, you know? 
just acting like an idiot, losing my control of my emotions. Sometimes as fathers, we, we fail because we prioritize the wrong things in life. You know, we prioritize the wrong things for our life. We think that money is more important than relationships, right? That time at work is more important than time with family. Or sometimes we prioritize, we screw up our priorities for our children and we teach them that it's more important to get straight A's than to follow Jesus or more important to, to excel in athletics than to follow Jesus. We get all of our priorities messed up and we fall short. And when we realize our shortcomings... we may be tempted to give up. When we realize how much we've messed up and depending on how, how bad we've messed up, we may be tempted to give in. But Jesus prays what Jesus did for Peter, he is doing for me and you. Jesus is praying that your faith may not fail. That in spite of your shortcomings, in spite of your failures, in spite of your sins, in spite of whatever you've done, Jesus is praying right now at the right hand of the Father that your faith may not fail you. That you won't give in. That you won't give up. That you won't say to... Well, I was going to say a word I didn't know I should say. To heck. I'll just say to heck. Does that work here? I mean, hell is a biblical term, but let's just say heck. To heck with being a father, being a husband. I'm out of it. I'm checking out of this. And Jesus is praying that whatever happens in our lives, our faith in him, our faith in our calling, our faith in serving him will not fail us. You may stop praying for yourself, but Jesus is still praying for you. Your friends may have given up on you. Your children may have given up on you, but Jesus never fails you. For all that Christ did for Peter, he now does for you. Praying that your faith may not fail you. And this truth affirms that we're not only saved by grace, but we're kept by grace. That the Lord will never lead us to a place where his grace will not keep us. It affirms that our dreams for faithfulness to him will be fulfilled not by our own power, but by the preserving power of God. It reminds us as fathers and mothers, as followers of Jesus, that it is God who preserves us, it is God who keeps us, it is God who holds us, it is God who never forsakes us, it is God who never fails us, and that God will not allow anything in heaven on earth and earth beneath to separate us from his love, for his strength is made perfect in our weakness. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. What a beautiful promise from the Lord today for that. But the conversation is still not over. There's one statement that remains. When you return, when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. I don't know. If I'm the hand personally appointed numero uno of the apostles, and I screw up big time, and everybody knows that I said it, I'm never going to deny the Lord, but I did. Everybody heard it. There's no running from it. The last place I want to go is back to the apostles. 
I think I just want to get out of there and say I messed up. But Jesus says, when you turn back, that is when you repent, when you come to your senses, I don't want you to lose your faith. When you turn back, get back to what I called you to do. Get back and strengthen your brothers. Notice that Jesus first predicts Peter's failure, then Jesus assures Peter of prayer support, knowing that Peter will deny him. Now Jesus tells Peter, when you come to your senses and repent of your sins, take your place as an apostle and encourage your brothers. In other words, Peter's betrayal did not disqualify him from his role as the rock. In fact, Jesus informs Peter that this sifting process will prepare Peter to teach Christians about humble dependence upon Jesus Christ. And I love this, I love this word. It liberates us. It teaches us that God does not call us to service expecting perfection. God does not call us to be fathers expecting perfection. Now I get an amen from the fathers? He doesn't expect perfection. He doesn't call us to fatherhood or service in his name expecting we will never sin. In fact, he knows it, that we will. Like every father before us, mess up. But he reminds us that our imperfections do not disqualify us. Did you hear that? And that is for every Christian in the house, for every person who's even considering Christianity. If you think that following Jesus means you need to be perfect, you need to hear this, that Jesus calls us knowing we're gonna mess up. And when we come to our senses and return to him, he wants us to get back to what he's called us to do, that our imperfections do not disqualify us because the Lord, he enlists weak soldiers for service in his army. He takes those who are weak and manifests his strength through them. He takes those who are unrighteous and illustrates his righteousness. He takes those who are sinful to talk about holiness. He takes dusty, broken instruments to play beautiful music. And he takes old, rusty tools to build his church. Fathers, God calls you to be a father. And your shortcomings do not disqualify you. God calls you to serve him and your failures do not terminate that call. That's why I have great news for you today. Incredible news. Great news for every person who has decided to follow Jesus, and great news for those who are considering following Jesus. The Lord calls us to serve him knowing we will be imperfect. The Lord calls us and then prays for us. He intercedes for us, praying that our shortcomings will not overwhelm us. He's praying that our faith will not fail. And finally, he reminds us that when we fall short, let's repent, let's confess, and then let's get back at serving for him. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the high calling of modeling your love as fathers. That sacrificial love that 
gave everything and giving your son to die for us. That unconditional love that keeps coming even when we don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord, for allowing fathers in the room to model your love for their children. And thank you, Lord, for calling each and every one of us to be your children, to experience and receive your love, and then share that love with others. Lord, I want to lift up the fathers in the house this morning and Hebron and jail online. I want to lift them up to you today because there's a father listening today who's ready to throw in the towel. There's a father listening today who thinks he's screwed up so much that he's forfeited his right to be a father. There's a father listening today who only is preoccupied with his shortcomings, with his weaknesses, and spends too much time with a bottle in his hand and not enough time in your word. There's a father listening today whose priorities may be misaligned. And they know it. He knows it. And he needs courage. Courage to repent. So I pray, Lord, for the fathers in the house, in Hebron and jail and online, that you will speak to each one and remind them that you've called them to this high calling of fatherhood, knowing they'll be imperfect. And that, Lord, you're praying that in the wake of their imperfections, their faith would not fail them. That they would not give up on you and not give up on their calling. And you're whispering into their ear even now, saying, hey, Dad, get back. Turn back. Encourage your children. Encourage your wife. Encourage your grandchildren. Get back at it. I pray for the fathers today, Lord, who hear this word, and would you empower them encourage them to get back at it. And for each one of us in the house, Lord, who thinks that our failures negate your love, for each one of us who thinks that we need to be perfect before we decide to follow you, would you remind us again, Lord, that <laughs> you call us to follow you knowing we're going to mess up. You don't call us expecting perfection. You call us to life abundant and free with you. You call us to freedom in you, knowing that we're going to mess up. And then while we follow you, you're praying for us, Lord Jesus, that our faith and your call and our decision to follow you will not fail us, that we'll not give up on you, no matter what's going on in life. No matter what difficulties we've endured, what sufferings we've faced this past week, we're not going to give up on you. We're just going to get back at it and serve you, follow you, trust you, lean on you, depend on you. For you are our Savior, our shelter, our refuge, our strength our alpha, our omega, our beginning, our end, our everything, the center of it all. Jesus, 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 how we love you. Embrace us with your love. And pray it in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say,